Good morning and welcome to a new episode of Dubai Works. This week, we have a very special guest. Marcus Smith is an extreme athlete, an entrepreneur, a motivational speaker, coach, and as an entrepreneur, he's the founder of Inner Fight and a partner in Smith Street Paleo, a health and performance company which he set up in, in 2008. I should say Inner Fight is a health and performance company he set up in Dubai in 2008. Inner Fight specializes in strength and conditioning, personal performance coaching, corporate uh, performance and motivation, uh, and endurance program, programs, and many more things. Marcus' personal achievements have put Dubai on the map globally, such as his 30 marathons in 30 days during the Dubai Fitness Challenge in 2018, I think. Uh, and uh, he also recently did a 24-hour consecutive running challenge he documents this and more on the inner fight digital platforms, including performance rated articles and podcasts, training plans and paleo food recipes. Today, this is a long intro, but he's many achievements. Uh, today we'll be discussing the story of inner fight, the status quo of the fitness industry and extreme fitness challenges. Good morning, Marcus. Hey, Rich, well done. That's not <laughs> easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. You've, you've achieved a lot, but I think you, you kind of ca- package it all under kind of one brand and one, one approach. So it's for people who know you, it's, it's a lot, but it's also simple. Yeah, we like to. I mean, that's one of our, our, our brand values, if, if you like, mate, simplicity. So it is quite sort of straightforward that we just wake up every day and just try and help people to get better in, in all areas of life, be it people that are going to work with their families, triathlon, whatever it is, we try and help people. And it's a lot of fun. How have you found the last few months specifically? It's been incredible, mate. It's something I was actually doing a talk yesterday and, you know, I, I say this, that moments in life, as we know, really define us. And on 15th of March, they closed my gym which is obviously my main revenue about 60 to 70% of our business is through that physical location. And someone walks in and takes away 70% of your revenue. You're, you're kind of in an interesting situation, but what I did at that within those few days, actually what I did the next day and, and, and I know you're a keen athlete as well yourself, Rich is the next morning I organized to go riding with some people that I enjoy being with. And then during that ride, I said to them, let's go to the mountains. And we went and sat in the mountains. On, on, I sat on Jebel Jace for two days, riding up it, running around, just having some fun. And then we moved to Cat Springs, which is another part of sort of the Hajar Mountains. And within those three or four days, I, I asked myself, and we just, we just shot back and forward with these, with these cool people that I'm with. Some of them work for me, other are friends what does this really mean? Like, what if we go, and this was before lockdown, mate, and we're like, what if we go into a lockdown? What's going to happen? And we all, I think like everyone, mate, we're all like, wow, this could happen and this could happen. And listening and talking for those three or four days, I came back on Friday night and I just started writing stuff down on Saturday. And the main thing that was coming through was people need help. They need more support than they've ever needed before. They're going into an extreme time of discomfort. And then I said, well, how can we, through health and fitness, support them? So literally, Rich, overnight, we created a a, a product called Fitness is the Cure, where we would write programs for people that they would do in their home. So you'd tell us, okay, I've got no equipment. I've got 30 minutes a day because I've got kids that are screaming. I'm working from home, you know, everything that everyone's faced. And we're like, yeah, that's fine. And all these different checkpoints and touch points that we put in. So we had people, we had coaches calling people on a daily basis and really just trying to help Mm. because in a fight is mental, right? As well as, as our physical side. So that's how we reacted. And I wasn't totally right. In, my, in our predictions on top of the mountain. I don't think anyone could have predicted it, mate. But we really saw, and I'm sure you experienced it as well, like it was just so alien what was going on. So those additional touch points were just absolutely key. And I think the brands that, there was a lot of brands that it was weird because they kept trying to sell people things. 
rather than connect with people on what I would just call an emotional level. Like we went out to our people and said, how can we support you emotionally? Sure, we're going to charge for it, but how are we going to support you emotionally? Mm -hmm. And I've seen over the last three to four months, the brands that said, we're going to support people here. We're going to, we're going to continue to do what we're doing. We're not going to ask you to pay we, if you don't want to pay. And we, we, we set up a lot of things that people haven't had to pay for. Mm. And we're fine with that as well. We sent out workouts every day. We've put out enduring, upped our content game, like mm. massively, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and brands that haven't done that and that have just thought about bottom line. I think they're the brands that have come into trouble. That's what I've seen. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And you've touched on a lot of things there, but have, how important fitness is for many people during uh, change and during difficult times. But you mentioned about, you know, 60, 70% of your revenue coming through a physical uh, entity or place such as the gym. Uh, did you realize, I think, you know, we certainly did that. And I think other people did as well that, when you're when you're uh, when you have a business and when you're pricing something you think it's because of the product and the value of it but actually there's so much added value that um yeah. when it goes away the people need and it's 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 baked into the price originally but you 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 know a lot of your uh clients and a lot of your your team and your customers uh needed that we call it emotional yeah. support but just needed that community and they can and that that can happen digitally it can happen in many different ways and it's hard to kind of price for it because it's not you know you can't it's not as tangible but actually it's as important it mate, you've you're like my best salesman ever because people will <laughs> come to us and listen we're expensive mate we're not the most expensive gym in town there's there's gyms that are more expensive but to, if you compare us to, to, to a big box gym, we're about three to four times more expensive. And generally what people, consumers, when they're, when they're gonna make a purchase, only can really read and, and research a product in, in different ways. They can call up, they can do all of that. How can I tell someone that the energy, like how can I put this in words without people coming in and feeling it, the energy that you're going to feel when you walk into my gym is like you'll feel nowhere else. The support that you're going to get from my staff is like nothing else. They're all like, yeah, yeah, that's just the sales pitch. <laughs> but when, when that was removed, then they realized. Mm. And then they're like, oh, yeah, actually now. And, and it's I don't blame consumers for behaving the way that they, they behave, Rich. It, it, it's very natural. And I think I'm the same. Like. You know, you're going to buy something on Amazon and you sort of find three different price points, don't you? You find the cheapest, you find the most expensive, and you find the one in the middle. And you're trying to figure out why. I mean, the other day I was buying a HDMI cable. And you can buy a HDMI cable from 20 dirhams to 150 dirhams. And I'm like, that's a big difference. Yeah. You know, but what really is the value proposition? And that's one of the things that I think, like I was saying before, like, brands that are communicating value and are still creating touch points with their clients during these tough times, I think are the brands that are going to end up in better shape. Yes, we have to sell. Mm. Yes, we still need revenue. Yeah, it was tough. And it, it still is quite tough. Yeah. But really focus on that, mate. And, you yeah. know, just continuing to do that. I think you're in good shape. It's interesting. And also, I'm hearing this a lot, you know, we think with lockdown and global pandemic that businesses go to zero, but that hasn't happened. Like, you know, some businesses have increased, some businesses have closed down, but many people took that kind of 60 to 80% cut. It's significant, but it's not zero. It doesn't mean it's game over. Um, so it is interesting. And it's great that you guys have adapted in that way. Moving on a little bit from COVID and talking about, I just want to ask a question around the fitness industry and inner fight. 2008 is a long time ago <laughs> in, in in Dubai time frame. Um, you set up a gym in 2008 and not an international brand. Uh, what was the kind of thinking at the time? It was really people were asking me to help them. And I realized that I had a skill to help people. I had a big focus on positive energy 
had a big focus on mental toughness. And I was helping people just since about 2004. And I never charged anyone for my services. I, I was just passionate. And then I was like, this is what people need. People need this different approach. Buying gym memberships does not make you, in your case, be able to do an Ironman. You know, you buy the program, you have to go out and do it. There's so much more to it than just the program itself. And I sort of tapped into those things early and I was like, I love this. I love making people better. And it's, I, I'm so confident that the product that we have, if people work with us and it takes time for them to, for some people to open up, but once they open up, we make a real difference in their life. And that's something that really means a lot to me as, as, as a human, because we have a certain skill set, and there's other people like me that work with me and for me that are able to help flick these switches that could save people really from going really off course to just smashing their life. And it's so weird to explain it because we we sell gym memberships, but through selling a gym membership and all these additional values, I saw people's relationships get better. I saw people get promoted at work or leave the job that they were in, like have the confidence to leave that job and pursue another career and do amazing. And yeah, it was a crazy move, mate, because I was working for Adidas at the time. And then I went on to work for Nike and I was comfortable in the corporate world. And, you know, and, and I loved selling shoes because they're pretty important to people as well, right? You know, it, it, I was a shoe salesman, mate, and it was just, it was amazing. But this, this addiction and this kind of skill that I think I had, and hopefully I still have, hopefully it's got better, mate, over the last 12 years, just to help people to get better. And because people, people would come to me and say, you know, oh, can I run 10K? No, I don't think I can run 10K. I'd be like, why not? Mm. Like, you know, like, why not? Why can't you, you know? And I, I was always like, trying to figure out, like, there's no reason why you can't. Mm. There's a reason, the only reason why you can't is because of the people you surround yourself with or, or, or the mindset you've developed and something's happening in the subconscious, which happens, mate. You know, these things can be long rooted back to childhood you know people children can be told no 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 and their subconscious keeps going for years and years saying no 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 so they all they've been hearing for 30 years is no 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 they don't have the confidence but people would come to me and say you know do you think i can i was like yeah of course you can and sometimes mate i'll be honest i'd look at people and go oh how am i gonna make <laughs> this work <laughs> you know? but I think you had you had um you had Big Rossi from uh the Chris Fade show and you got him to do a marathon. I still can't believe that he he finished the marathon. He'd never he never run more than 15k and he finished the marathon in a pretty respectable time. So whatever you're doing is it works. <laughs> but Rich it, it, it it's quite simple in that he would say he would literally he's big but he's soft inside mate. He's a little <laughs> big teddy bear and it's just that positive affirmation he, he just constantly say to me mate do you think i can do it i'm like if you keep running you'll do it okay. you know <laughs> yeah like, like, oh, just don't stop do you? Like, <laughs> if you keep moving forward you just don't stop yeah. you know and he's like oh what so it's that affirmation time and again that okay. you know and a lot of people will just tell us we can't but i just think we can yeah. you know and that's, that's been my mindset for, for, for a long time. And I think that was my mindset from when I was young and it was probably ingrained from me from my parents a lot. So I've got them to thank for, for a lot of it. And, and you grew up here, Marcus, and you played rugby professionally. Um, do, do you think that this region, not everyone would have had a, a kind of a athletic or a fitness background. Um, do you think in this region that it's harder to kind of um, inspire people to do say long distance sports or that they can believe that they can achieve it. Is that what you found at inner fight over the years? I think the one, the problem is fundamental in that there's too much choice. When you and I were younger, there wasn't a choice to watch Netflix play on a PlayStation or anything like that. And I mean, 
mate, me and, we look old, but we're not actually that old. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, we would go outside, we would go running, but now the choices that people have are, they're just too bored. There's too much choice. And a lot of the choices like cinema, there was no cinema when I was young here, there wasn't even a TV channel. So all I had to do was go out and play. Now, if you look at it and let's go on the endurance side, because I know you're interested, we have literally the best facilities in the world for triathlon. We have professionals from Europe, from America, Australia, wherever, coming to Dubai in the winter months and training. I was talking to Faris Al Sultan a few weeks back, who's world champion of, of Ironman. Pete Jacobs, a friend of mine, 2012 world Ironman champion. They used to come here to train. Mm. You know, tomorrow morning, you and I will be riding on a bike track that I think without going back on yourself, you can make about 130 Ks, maybe more. This morning I was running on a beach track that by the beach, beautiful, I can run 15 Ks. And that's unless I wanna go down the canal. And I know the water's a bit hot at the moment, so sorry about that for all the swimmers. But Dubai has, for eight months of the year, the perfect climate and the perfect facilities. The excuse that people are using is this fast choice. If you want to do something, I have clients that are, are training for Ironmans in London, and that's hard. We can put our bikes in the back of our car. We can go and sit on Al Qudra. For you triathlon boys, you can sit on the tri bars, fall asleep. Three hours later, the session's done. Mm. It's beautiful. So we, it, the, the problem is not, the problem is choice. That's, that's, there's just way too many options. But do you think, I, I, I take that point and I didn't think of it, but, but do you think it's also, you know, we, we grew up watching people from our native countries perform in the Olympics. Um, whereas in some of the, not just Dubai, not just the, the United Arab Emirates, but across the region, it, maybe it's not as ingrained. Um, and, you know, we see in football, Hamad Salah doing such great things. And now people will believe that they can do it too. Do you think there's an, and, you know, going back to kind of the Dubai Fitness Challenge and the thought process behind that, which you fully embrace and inspired many, uh, is that sort of a barrier for some people as well? Yeah, it, it's a real tough one that you've touched on there, Rich. And if you look at, there was an article recently in The Economist about the Olympics, and there was a thought put in that article that this game that all the youths are playing, Fortnite, would be in the Olympics mm. in years to come. Instead, imagine, instead of javelin, we're going to play Fortnite. But the attention of these youths, children, what, whatever category you put them in, okay. the number of them on that platform is way more. It's like 10 times more than those that actually watch the Olympics. So we're in a really interesting situation. And for me, the sad thing is that a lot of the choices are not as, what we'd say, healthy choices. So although I think... There might be a lot of benefits. I haven't looked into Fortnite. I'm, I'm not in that era. Um, there, there might be a lot of benefits to that game. From what I understand, you play it sat down, hmm. which is a real problem for us as human beings. We're made to move. So it's a really interesting time we're in, and the Olympics in itself in the coming years is going to change a lot. Hmm. When you look at celebrities now, and this has been one of my – <laughs> anger points for a long time is that and, and I think it really hit home when Messi was the ambassador for a fast food company he was an ambassador for that fast food company because that was probably very lucrative mm. but he's promoting the messaging that we're getting towards children that look at him as an icon is really quite negative Okay, and a, a lot of people have, have, have watched during lockdown, uh, the Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, which amazing. I grew up with Jordan. It, it's amazing. But I was just incredibly disappointed that, you know, it was obvious that he was drinking alcohol during the interviews. And I was like, what message is that sending 
to people. Mm. So there's these branding messages from these icons that they've become that is also not helping the youth of today mm. and people to have a healthy lifestyle, which is quite sad. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I guess there is a responsibility on on these professionals to you know, uh, influence and be responsible. That's interesting. I want to, I want to touch, go back on the inner fight brand, because, you know, you talked to, about the added value on top of it and, uh, that you have created a brand. And I think it's quite obvious for, uh, anyone who's spent a couple of years in Dubai or any, anyone loosely associated with sports or fitness to know how strong that brand is. Uh, how have you done it? What were the challenges? What's the sort of history? Um, you know, I think we know of comparison. We know of international gym chains, uh, and we also know of international brands, say like Barry's Bootcamp, who are a little bit more bespoke. But you haven't. Yeah. You've done that from here. Uh, how? What's the story been? <laughs> hey, honestly, the story is quite simple, and it's based on a few different principles. Give value to people. That's number one. And I've probably mentioned it already a lot. Give people value. Like I always see it that someone's people work hard for money and someone's going to pay you some of their hard work money mm. for you to make them better or for you to deliver a service. So, and this is what I say to my staff all the time, over deliver on that service, give them so much value that you keep them forever. There's a book, the Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game, and it's 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 amazing. Or well, the Infinite Mindset, or something that's called like that. It's been out a few months. It's a long game. A lot of people, especially companies in Dubai, especially fitness companies, it's like we'll get this up and running. Five years, we're out. We've made our million. Have a nice time. But then what? It's just empty. When money is the sole motivator, it's just completely empty. Mm. I went from the corporate world making very good money to the first month that I had my own business, I made not even half, like a third, uh, less than a quarter of what I'd made in the corporate world. So value is number one. The second thing that's super important is, although and you said it before the show, Cheeky, I talk a lot. I also <laughs> listen a lot. So I'll, I'll literally just sit with people and one of my sort of KPIs is I used to try and have a coffee with someone every day for the first six months that I set up my own business and I just drill them with questions mate I just how why when mm. why would you do that and and listen and then make notes and I think we we're often asking people questions and before we've really listened to the answer we're getting ready to go back on something mm. and we, we communicate in this really passive aggressive way these days and we don't listen enough. So that those two are really key value, listen, and then branding and, and, and really, I'm not super smart, mate, but just basic marketing. We had a mailing list from day one and I put our brand on everything that I could. Mm. I made coffee mugs so that when people would sit in their office, they'd see in a fight written on them. Mm. The, when I had no money, I made wristbands that had in a fight written on them. We've made, and this is mind blowing. We've made one t-shirt. I'm not wearing it today. I'm going against what I say, but this is my business formal. So <laughs> it's okay. I'm you have the wristbands. Of... It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we made one t-shirt that has in a fight on it. And we made it in hundreds of different colors mm. and people, especially here in Dubai. And I knew this from my rugby playing days that as humans, one of the things that we love is to belong to something. So if we created something that people could belong to, yeah. they could be proud to wear our brand on their chest. We would create a brand that would get out there. And now, I get pictures from literally mate and we send apparel around the world. Mm. Oh, I saw, I saw someone walking down the street with an inner fight shirt on and it's like a secret, you know, I know you, <laughs> but it's not rocket science. We just did good branding and good marketing. And then when people walk into that space, when, when, when we got our own space, I made the energy 
I work hard on the energy with the coaches. Mm. We have a, a, a playbook, which is not normal for gyms of normally in gyms, you'll have standard operating procedures for health, safety, and how you're going to teach people. We have a playbook on how we're going to talk to people. Okay. What we're going to say to people when they come in, what sort of fuss are we going to make when Rich walks into the gym? Literally, I'm going to see you from across the room and I'm going to start shouting at you. Rich! <laughs> and you're just going to feel this energy, mate, mm. that, you know, and people are just, what? Because it's so unnormal in gyms. But okay. it makes you, the client, feel amazing. It gives an energy and it makes, it breaks down all these barriers of what we've seen for so long in gyms of stereotypes of, you know, buff guys doing bicep curls. Yeah. Like, I, I don't blame people for, for hating yeah. gyms. Yeah. They're awful places. So they're some of the things, mate. And, and, and this all leads to, and we put a lot of time into it, and it's really the final point in building it, is community, is bringing those people together, bringing, and mate, we, we, we used to sit as a group of coaches, this is, we, we tell people now, but we used to sit as a group of coaches and go, this is so odd. Those two people that are over there having a coffee or over there riding their bikes together in normal life just would never talk. But because they're connected through a brand and through a sport, they're having, they've become friends. Mm. And you start to connect people and you build a community and people see and feel that and it grows. And it's organic, mate. We're, we're talking 12 years. Yeah, We didn't start this. And, you know, I'm not retiring anytime soon, mate. You know what I mean? It's not, and that was never the plan. I'm, I'm, I'm 42 this year and I want to do this forever because it's so much fun. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's a good point about the longevity and thinking about the long game because, you know, sometimes people might uh, try to expand too quickly and not build that meaningful sort of connection and business. But just talking about the kind of the economics or the margins or the real, you know, the fitness industry and the gym industry, uh, what do, what do people consider when they're going into it? Is there a lot of capex? Uh, is there, you know, what's the, what are the yeah. basics? And then from listening to people and how you've adapted and talking about CrossFit and you know different types of coaching plans, how is the how has your product evolved over the years? That's a really good question. We started out as a CrossFit gym, so capex is not a huge. You don't need a huge amount. And that's why CrossFit as a brand, obviously it's gone through some interesting things recently, but as a brand was amazing for so many people because we could get gyms up and running. We could go back to basic human movement and have a great time. If you're looking at a big box gym, the CapEx is absolutely huge. Now that said, we're not, the difference between a big box gym and what we'd now know as boutique gyms or studio gyms is that we have about 250 members. A big box gym has about eight to 9,000 members per location, and they sit and pray that none of them come. Where I have about 250 members, it's true, mate, because if they all do, they don't have enough equipment. But, so when, you're, when you've got eight or 9,000 members right. and you're charging $100 a month, you've got a decent amount of revenue. On our side, we're a lot different, is that I want everyone to come because I want, I can't change their life in two or three months. For a lot of people, it takes longer. What we've seen is we have the ability to add different products on. And that's really where our endurance business started is that I was into endurance anyway. And we're like, we can use this brand and we can help people over there. Is it a lot more lucrative? No, because, and this is where for everything that I love about Dubai, this is where I think SMEs are not really helped massively because we have huge overheads when it comes to licenses, visas, and should it be different from bigger companies? I don't know. And I, that's not, we shouldn't be arguing that, but it is very challenging. Like I have, when, when you look at trade license costs, visa costs, mandatory medical costs, it's sort of just, that just knocks out your bottom line. Mm. And this is why we're seeing gyms open and close a lot because people come in business plans look great 
but the reality, you don't get all the members in. It's really hard work. We're open from half five in the morning. I get there five in the morning, a lot of days, and we could be there till about eight or nine at night. Mm. It's a super long day. Mm. And it's not just, I know I work out a lot and I put a lot of workouts on Instagram and blah, blah, blah. But, and that's, I do do that, but also it's super long days, mate. So it's difficult. It, if you're building a small studio gym, it needs to be that. It needs to be ultimately personal. It needs to be high value. You need to really care. And if you think you're going in and exiting in three to five years and sitting on the beach in Thailand forever, I'm not really sure. You can look at, I mean, fitness first figures, I think are published online. They, I remember looking at them a few years ago and their, their, their net margin was about 5%. So that gives you an idea. Yeah. It's not a lot. Yeah, interesting. And um, what are the sort of uh, trends, you know, do you think that uh, this sort of the COVID-19 uh, and the digital economy around fitness has, has been uh, accelerated? Do you think that, you know, the, uh, the physical space is as important? And, you know, I want to ask as well about the new, the new facility that you're working on at the moment. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I'll answer the first question first, because I, I thought at the start there would be a, yes, there would be a massive transition to a permanent solution of online. But then with talking to clients and really looking at humans and our human behavior, we actually like hanging out with each other, hmm. whether that's in a coffee shop, in a gym, restaurant, bar, whatever it is, human interaction is really important. And although platforms like this, Zoom are great, we like to see, and it, I'm not sure if it's appropriate right now to say touch and feel each other, but we're touchy feely people. Mm. Like when someone pats you on the back, you feel good. So I think some people, to answer the question straight, people have realized that just because they can't get to a gym, it's not an excuse not to work out, but there is, there is, gyms will still be there. Restaurants will still be there. But ones that aren't making people happy, aren't giving value, will go away. Coming on to our new facility, that was incredible timing, mate, because it couldn't, like, you know, I, I go up there and, and, and when we're done here, I'm, I'm up there and I'm sat looking at this building that I've invested <laughs> in again. And I'm like, the economy is at rock bottom, <laughs> the premium brand. And it's just like, mate, I have some days yeah. and I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> oh God. Is going to be the next person to park his car at Dubai airport, you know, <laughs> 2008 and just on a jet plane. But mate, I'm, I'm really confident because of what I said before, we've realized that it's not just about, or we knew from a long time, it's not just about working out. We've worked really hard on that gym. We've got two gym spaces. We've been to that area. We've looked at the demographic. We understand that people like, and this is a little bit of a stereotype, mate, but if you take a mid 30 year old mother, she's just had a second child, hasn't had a lot of exposure to health and fitness, maybe doesn't feel great about herself. Those two children, I mean, I'm creating a bad scenario, but they weren't, it weren't, wasn't straightforward for her. She really doesn't like going to a gym. It's just, it's awful. It's intimidating. It creates anxiety. And we've created a gym within our gym that caters towards that lady, because we know that people through physical exercise, like I said, very early on, will have massive impact on all different areas of their life. And they know that as well. But if they go to a big box gym, they're lost. If they go to more of a studio or a boutique gym, it might work, it might not. Sometimes it does. And we want to jump into that space as well. So we also know that there's a lot of people right now who are, who are suffering, mate, you know, whether that's mentally, emotionally, some people physically are, are, are suffering, you know, the COVID kilos, as we say, we're, we're lucky most of our community have, have dropped weight at this time. But, you know, I've seen so many people that, and we've, we've been inundated with people, when are you opening because we want to come and, 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 and get involved because we put on five or 10 kilos during mm. COVID. So, you know, I think it's pretty much health and fitness is quite 
what I'd call recession proof. Mm. However, the, the, the demands for some people are going to change. Some people have had salary cuts and so might not be able to afford our fees anymore. As I said, we're not the most expensive, but we're definitely not the cheapest. And I respect that. Mm. You know, we're not going to cut our prices, mate, because to deliver what we're delivering and the value takes yeah. incredible amount of time and energy. So we'll keep our prices the same. I don't believe in discounting products. I believe in increasing the value of your product. And I think that's where a lot of brands are getting it wrong. And it, we're almost in a scenario now where it could literally be a race to the bottom. And if you, if you drop your price, at what point do you go, yeah, the market's back. I'm going to put it back up again. You don't, you know, do. And if you, if you do like, how does your customer feel? So we're excited to open mate. We're up there in studio city, which, from what I hear, it seems like most of the Palm, the Marina crew are all jumping up to three and four bedroom houses yeah. up in, in those developments. So when yeah. I hear every person I hear that tells me they're moving, I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a big catchment area and there's new developments all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, I think it's for anyone to make an investment and to, uh, done what you've done at this time must be daunting but as you said before you, you you're building something meaningful and long term and you believe in the fitness industry but equally it's not as if you're opening something brand new you've you've built up that sort of brand equity and the community uh who are ready to walk through the door in the first day yeah absolutely mate and and i thank them because they've trusted us with their health for a long time at the same time as we've been over, we spent 12 years building this brand. It's not a new concept. A lot of the people in that area haven't been able to access us before. And I'm blown away. They're excited that, that, that we're coming up there. So although I'm, I've readjusted the figures, so to speak, and, and, and the forecasts are down about 35%, we are pretty confident that we'll have a good time up there. And I don't want to sell in a fight in three years. We didn't move to that location to, to get rid of it in three years. The plan for us is that actually we're, we're taking a community-based health club. We're putting it in a residential community. Mm. And I want to prove that model so that we could potentially roll that out in a number of different residential communities. Because what, what makes a community valuable is not just another big chain gym that no one goes to. What makes a community valuable for people to want to go and live in is community-based activities, whether it's a really nice coffee shop, whether, you know, on the F&B side or good activities. That's what people want right now. So that's one of, that really is one of my goals. And, we're, mate, I've been here since 83. I'm not going anywhere. It's all good. <laughs> when you say different residential communities within the UAE or in other places also? I would like to think that it could go global. I, I don't think I'm the person to take it global. I'll be honest right now. I don't have any aspirations to, to, to do that, but I want to develop a model, which I want to prove our model within that residential community yeah. that potentially maybe in 10 years, we would sell it or we would franchise it to other parts of the world. That's kind of the way I see it going. Uh, locally, we would partner with developers to bring them something that is yeah. super strong or, or we would do it on our own. Like let's get to that bit first and yeah. then we'll, we'll, we'll jump over it. Yeah. And it's, yeah. When a lot of people talk about, uh, starting new businesses now, it's all related to it used to be apps and now it's all to do with digital things. So it's good to, I think a lot of people will find value and, more inspiration from you, Marcus, that, you know, you're thinking positively uh, during this time. Uh, speaking about d digital trends and fitness, uh, do you think some of the kind of um, things like uh, work from home, uh, what do they call them? N not like Fortnite, but uh, like Swift and yeah. Peloton. Are these, are these yeah. uh, complementary to what you do? Um, and how do you yeah. see that space? Absolutely, mate. I think if we take Swift, which for those people that don't know it, is a cycling app that we've actually used a lot. And it's, it's a virtual app, so your computer will come up. You can see yourself on there. You can see all your power numbers, all the geeky stuff that, that us endurance athletes love. 
we as a as a company will we had three rides a week we've scaled it down to one now that people are are, are able to get outside but we see that continuing for quite a long time the reason be, and we see our online solution continuing as well the reason being is that prior to covid if people were not able to make a training session they would not do at the gym they would not do that session and that for me is quite sad because that could be because they need to spend time with their family because they were traveling now that people have proven to themselves that we can send them a workout through the software and they can do it in their house in the hotel room with minimal equipment and still benefit their minds been open to it mm. so we will definitely have clients rich that i'll take a, a simple example that used to come five times a week will now come three times a week and we'll do two home workouts which will enable them to spend more time with their children on those two days and i think that's absolutely incredible obviously if we program those two workouts then we keep all of the revenue within our gym if they found an app or, or, or a platform that they think is better for those two workouts, that's fantastic as well, because mm. they're now able to use their time in different ways. So I think those apps are here to stay. I think it's a similar question to, will all air travel stop for business meetings and will we just use Zoom? And you know, I think at the start of COVID, people were like, no, we can do videos the whole time. But even now, mm. people are like, can we meet for a coffee? I've had enough of this Zoom thing. Yeah. So. It's, it's, it's kind of gonna play itself out. I think when people are allowed back and they've been allowed back here to gyms in the UK, there's a big spike and then we'll see kind of a plateau. But I think for me, mate, jumping on Zwift with the guys at 6 a.m. on a Wednesday in my own house saves me the drive to Al Qudra, saves me the drive back from Al Qudra. Yesterday morning, half seven, I was at my desk able to do stuff. I had a busy day, I had an hour cycle, I'd seen all of my friends and clients. We'd had a great time. We'd all hit the same session and I was buzzing, mate. It's it's absolutely amazing. Do I want to do that for every bike session I do? Yeah. No. Nah. So there's going to be a mix. That's great. Yeah, interesting. And um, we could talk at length about the digital trends and the fitness industry and many things, but I want to talk about, you know, um, endurance sport and ultra uh, extreme challenges because I know you've done many. Can you just uh, give the listeners an overview of what you've accomplished um, um, and then talk about the decision process that goes into these running through the night in these perceived crazy events? I guess my two sort of two or three biggest ones, you highlighted them at the start. Thank you for that. I ran 30 marathons in 30 days consecutively in 2018 and i ran for 24 hours around a 400 meter track in at the end of 2019 actually started running ultra races in 2013 and the reason my, my why is is very pretty much in line with everything i do i want to make my family proud i want to explore is the best word i use for it my own human potential and in doing so hopefully inspire others to explore theirs and finally, I, I want to learn a little bit about myself. And I found these extreme physical challenges tick all of those boxes. It was quite funny. At the start of COVID, I was on a call and I had to a, a, a sort of meet up a mastermind on Zoom and I had to introduce myself. And, you know, people, there were some real smart guys on there. And I was like, oh, no, what do I say? And I was like, hmm, yes. And then I got it. I was like, yeah, COVID is making people quite uncomfortable. Well, actually, for the last... 10 years of my life, I've been searching for physical discomfort. And, and that's really what sort of I, I, you know, I put it down to. And through that, I've developed what, what a sort of package, we're talking business, is called the ultra mindset, which is almost, there's two sides to this. There's a problem solving points that I go through, which is, if you've got a problem, don't be in denial, admit you've got a problem, reject the fact that it's going to stop you from achieving your goal. Relax. We're all too highly stressed out. Just relax and breathe and then just figure out what am I going to do right now? So I follow those four points in, in everything. A lot of people linking it to COVID because it resonates with people during the early parts of COVID were like, I'm going to go to bed tonight 
and this is going to be gone tomorrow. Like people are actually trying to convince themselves that that was the case, mm. you know, and it's not like it's a problem and we have to identify that they're problems, but we don't have to let them stop us from doing what we're doing. In my case, a lot of endurance events. So I use those four points and then I also use sort of three or four other points, which is taking care of admin, making sure everything you can control is really, really under your control. The second thing is actually staying focused. We're really easily distracted these days. And if I get distracted in an ultra race, I can make a wrong turn and I've done it. I was on Penny Fan in Wales in a 90, it was a 90K race and I went down the other side because I was busy taking pictures at the top. And okay. <laughs> like, it was, I was with a friend of ours, I uh, think with mutual friend Tom Otten, and we yeah. went down the wrong side. And we added 5Ks. That's definitely his got, fault. That's, that's his fault, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, I'll no, put it, but, literally yeah. put, it, uh, put it straight on him. You know, and, and, and then the other thing, mate, is that life is sometimes up and sometimes you feel down. And we need to be okay with that. And in ultras, in endurance, you know it through what you've done, Rich. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. It's the same in business, in relationships, in everything. You go up, you come down a little bit. It's not cool living life on, on, on one line. But Marcus, you, you go up very high. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. I would like to discuss it because it's, it, do some of the things that you do, are they dangerous? And then secondly, do you, someone who has achieved a lot, do you ever have doubts? <laughs> um, are they dangerous? They were. And that led to my accident in 2018 when I was actually training for ultra cycling and I was hit by a truck and I, oh. I was nearly killed. And that was very tough, mate. It was tough for me. It was tough for my family. And when I came out of that, and I think it's the right thing to do. And as I said, one of my biggest motivations is my family is I never want to leave the house and for them to feel like I might not come back again because they already had that that day mm. when they got a call and I was in intensive care. And I think, you know, the way that Polly, my wife was then was, it was just incredible, mate. And so, yes, some of my challenges are dangerous, but they, I like to think that they're calculated and I'm not risking my life and therefore risking the happiness of my of my family mate so i think that's that's sort of really important when it comes to doubt i don't really have a doubt in what we can do i have more interest in exploring what we can do and there are races that and challenges that i have not completed i'd, I'd be lying if i sat here and and told you i've completed everything and it's the same in my business mate i told you the things that that worked and i told you how we built the brand uh, we could sit for hours talking about stuff that we did that didn't work taglines for marketing to, that we came up with that didn't work and it's the same races or challenges that i've done that i've not been able to get through there, but there's a reason and we learn and yes okay. in the immediate aftermath if you launch a marketing campaign or if you have to pull out of a challenge you can feel a certain amount of disappointment but if you really start to unlock or uncover why it went that way and you look at it as a learning and then you're like, right, we tried that. I tried to run to such and such a place. I didn't make it because of X, Y, and Z. I tried this marketing campaign. It didn't work because of X, Y, and Z. Cool. Next time we'll address those X, Y's and Z's and we'll make sure that we don't make the same mistake twice. Great. And that's good answer. <laughs> that's another thing. My, my, my dad always used to say that. He used to say, you'll make mistakes. He said, just come and tell me you've made a mistake. He said, if you make the same mistake twice, then I'll be angry. And yeah. you know, that's why I say to my staff, I'm like, don't, it's fine to make mistakes. Just understand why you've made it and let's not make it again. Yeah. 
it's, it's human nature. So that's kind of how I look at it, mate. Growth, growth mindset. Okay, I, we could clearly, I'm trying to get through everything I introduced you it's because it kind of sets it up. And if I don't, <laughs> but just talking about nutrition, because obviously, you know, you're, you're an expert in that or, uh, you know, have a lot of experience uh, and you're involved, in a partner in a, in a paleo uh, company. What What's your general advice about nutrition? And can you talk about different types of diets briefly, if possible? Yeah, yeah of course. I can. <laughs> um, the simple thing with nutrition, and this is actually quite easy to nail, don't eat processed foods, don't eat sugar. Eat what's natural. There's one saying that people might not agree with the second part, but if you can grow it or kill it, eat it. Very straightforward. Don't eat too much and don't eat too little. If you're hungry, you're eating too little. If you're feeling full or you're gaining weight, which would mean that you would have to buy a new belt or buy different clothes, like they're really obvious signs, you're eating too much. Mm. But if you keep it unprocessed, so if you take chicken, meat, fish, and you put some vegetables with it, and you don't put processed food is everything that comes in a tin or a jar that will last more than a week. If your food in your house lasts more than a week, it's processed, it's got additives and preservatives in it, you don't need them. They're not helping you, they're probably only hindering you. Stay away from sugar and you do pretty good. You walk down the street right now, Rich, and ask 10 people if ice cream is good for them, I'm pretty sure you'll get 10 no's. We, we know, mate, if you're doing more physical exercise, so you're gonna go and ride your bike tomorrow, maybe for four hours, you need more food. If you're doing less physical exercise, you need less food. It is really, there is too much. I, I actually, just before we, we hopped on here, I made a, 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 a bit of content around counting calories. We've become by the fitness industry, I'll take, I, I work in it, we've become obsessed with calorie counting and you know triathlon's terrible 60 grams of carbohydrate an hour otherwise i'm gonna hit the wall like ultra is a little bit different we we kind of eat when we're hungry yeah. and you know and and when we can and i think that's one of the things yes there are it's a little bit more complex than that of course mate but for real actionable takeaways that's it there's a load of different diets there's a load of different fads paleo is pretty much what I'm what I'm saying here, it's quite straightforward. It's very traditional. It's from, from a long time ago, like a lot of them are. Um, new diets are going to come. Try it if it works for you. There's no one diet for everyone, mate. If you go vegetarian, if you go vegan, and you're getting the results you want, one of the things, mate, and this is what I tell a lot of my clients, is every morning you jump out of the shower, get in front of the mirror, get the towel off, and ask yourself, do I look amazing? If the answer is yes, and you start to smile, and you're ready to absolutely smash your day, you're in pretty good shape. But I guarantee you, a lot of people don't even take that towel off. That's because of what you eat. Interesting. Amazing. Thanks for simplifying it. And we didn't, yeah, we didn't get too technical, but there's good takeaways there. Finally, just to finish on, there's a lot of people who um, you know, don't have challenges or goals in mind because of the uncertainty of races, uh, different things, and, you know, being able to go to gyms. What would your advice be? And what are you at Inner Fight focusing on for the next six months, basically? Yeah, it, it, this is a really good question. And a lot of people's physical goals are related to the, the holiday they're going on. They want to look good on the beach or nerds like you and I, where we want to race, you know, and go to all these great events and, and that's all being taken away. There's two different ways that I look at it. One is what I was saying there, look good naked. That is a great goal. Like it really is. You want to get out of that shower every morning. You want to look in the mirror and go, yes, I've got this. I feel and look amazing and I'm ready for today. The second thing is where you wanted to be whether that's absolutely shredded for your beach holiday or in the endurance form of your life for your Ironman, just knock off 15 to 20% and see how long you can sit at about 80%. Because airports will open and races will restart and you don't want to start from zero. Mm. If you start, if you're at that 80%, that's a great place to live, guys. Mm. It really, really is. We shouldn't need to be yo-yoing 
All right, summer, I need to get in shape. All right, it's winter, I can put a jacket on, not in Dubai, but in the UK. Everyone's covered up in winter. It doesn't matter if I'm carrying a bit of extra blubber. Why? You don't feel good. And then it really, the final thing, mate, is it comes down to that feeling. Do you honestly feel good? And people, again, if you ask 10 people, like, do you feel really good? Do you wake up? Do you feel fresh? Are you ready to go? I mean, I was up at half four this morning. I want to do this. Like, I want to go, you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm just eating good food and sleeping eight hours and feeling great. And right now, that's awesome for me. I'm, I'm as devastated as anyone else that I can't go on my summer holiday this year and I can't race because they're great things that I enjoy in life but I'm also enjoying just feeling super good. So you just got to reset the goal and the focus a little bit and be committed to it. Say what your 80% is and go and get it. Amazing. We leave it there. Thanks very much for your time this morning, Marcus. Appreciate it, It's mate. been great. Thank you for having me. Great listening to you. Thanks a lot and speak soon. Yes.